Hi, this is Survival Woman, aka Lana Lisa Williams in California and in Central California. And today is Sunday, April 11, 2021. And I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about how I became Survival Woman. I didn't give that name to myself. Um, Some of you have heard my story because I've written about it and I've done videos about it. And um, I survived a lot in my life. I lost my whole family when I was really young. My mother, first my father actually, and then my mother, and then my only little brother. And um, it was hard growing up like that and having to fight for myself um, kind of reminds me of the James Bond film called Skyfall, you know, James Bond 007. And um, his recruiter said that orphans make the best recruits. <laughs> and yeah, I guess orphans do because they don't have the family to worry about the bad guys getting, you know, if they mess up as a spy. Not that I'm a spy, but I have a special role to play that I didn't ask for. And I didn't ask to be this survival person. Um, After I survived the loss of my family, I also survived spousal abuse and divorce and running off to New Zealand with my children to try to get away from all that and being forced back to California and having to start all over. And it's really hard to build a life back up after a divorce when you're a woman and you've been a housewife and a homeschool mom. Yeah, homeschool mom. And you don't have a big, you know, a lot of work experience. So it was hard. And then I survived cancer, um, a rare type when my son, my youngest child, my son, Jonathan was just a baby. And Jessica, my daughter, my younger daughter was only three years old. And, um, I always kind of been my own best doctor because I knew something was wrong. (laughs) And I was right. And the doctors first said, oh, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. Come back in a few months and get it checked. And I'm like, no, check it now. And I was right. Um, So yeah, you can be your own best doctor because you know your body better than anyone. So I wrote these books about surviving cancer. And the first one was called Crossing the Chemo Room, about how I had four months of chemotherapy after I had minor surgery. And I lost all my hair and looked really pale. And it wasn't a lot of fun um, going around with no hair and looking really pale with a baby and a toddler and two older kids who were early teens with attitudes. (laughs) And anyway, this is my book. Oh, by the way, it's going to look backwards to you, so don't mind that. It just says crossing the chemo room in my name, but you can see the photo like regular. So that's, that's actually me in Turkey. You can see I'm dressed up like Sultan Hurem, who was a famous wife of a Sultan who was Russian, white woman, blonde, blue eyed, you know, and everyone in Turkey, I lived there two and a half years and taught English, said I look like her. I even bought a Sultan Hurem evening gown, which I gave to my daughter, Jessica. So Crossing the Chemo Room was the first of my survival series books. It actually says survival series on the bottom, but it's going to look backwards to you. That's just so weird how when I turn the camera around, everything is backwards in print. But anyway, so that's book one of my survival series. And it's about how I went through the whole cancer thing and starting to recover after that. And then I wrote book two which was, I took that photo in Hollywood, by the way. Yep, that's Hollywood, um, California. And this is I Saw You in the Moon. And it's book two of my survival series. (laughs) And it's, you know, more like how the kids are getting older. And I interviewed doctors and nurses and asked them about cancer and how do you prevent it? And what kind of diet should you have to keep from getting it? And I didn't, I didn't do anything to get cancer. I didn't smoke. I ate really healthily. I was in pretty good shape, but 
I got it anyway, probably because as a child, I was exposed to radiation. I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and one of the causes is radiation. So yeah, I might as well just glow in the dark. <laughs> um, and then chemotherapy didn't help, but hey, I got through all that by the grace of Jesus. And I'm not kidding about that either. <laughs> so book three is called Fire and Ice. And the cover is from South Korea. You can barely see me. I'm with my phone in a, in a fancy restroom on top of a big shopping mall that I discovered. South Korea is amazing. And I, I actually went near the North Korean border and um, it was really creepy. <laughs> and I had been living in China, in Northeast China, at the very corner where Russia um, North Korea and China come together. So I was finally on the Korean side of that, and it was just weird <laughs> um, to be in that part of the world. I was only in South Korea for three weeks, but, you know, I had adventures. So um, this book, Fire and Ice, talks a bit about teaching English in Russia, which I did first of the three countries where I taught English, and a little bit about my first impressions of Turkey, because I could only take so much of Russia and went to Turkey and lived there the longest. And um, so you might enjoy my travel adventure book, Fire and Ice, because life can be like fire on one hand and ice on the other. And yeah, put the two together and you've got a mess. <laughs> All right, so... Those are my survival story books, and that's not even how I got the name Survival Woman. It was after I got divorced from my abusive husband, who sadly is the father of Jessica and Jonathan, and you know, um, I was seeing, I had to see a counselor, a psychologist, he had a PhD, and he was seeing my Jessica and Jonathan, they were the younger two, the older two were pretty much out of the house. And um, he was seeing my two kids and me and writing up reports to the court like, oh, she should never see those kids again. She's crazy or whatever he decided to say. And I told him that I'd survived the loss of my family and cancer and spousal abuse, which of course my ex denied completely and said I was just a liar. <laughs> and he looked at me, this psychologist with a PhD degree, and I've got a master's degree, but I didn't want to go for my PhD. It's a lot of extra work. And he said, wow, you've got some survival skills. So I kind of thought, yeah, you know, I do. And also I had survived two car accidents where I rolled my car. <laughs> yeah, go figure. And almost died. I mean, I could have died and got out with a bunch of scars on my hand. You can see that. Yeah almost lost my right hand, which would have really been bad for writing on a keyboard. <laughs> um, and I hurt my neck a bit, but hey, I'm way better. <laughs> so I survived very bad car accidents too. <laughs> and um, Jesus brought me through all this stuff. It's amazing. And I survived overseas for five years on my own, teaching English in Russia, Turkey, and China. Those were not easy things to do. <laughs> But ironically, coming back to America was even harder because California is crazy expensive and crazy in a lot of other ways. Anyway, those are my survival series books. One, two, and three. But I also do, just quick note, I also do fun stuff for girls mostly, like teenage girls, young adults, or women, whoever wants to read. Um, this is my favorite cover. And this is Like a Tree Planted. And I took this photo in Turkey, of all places, but it is not a desert. <laughs> On top of a mountain in Turkey that's not far from Istanbul. And something is about to come through that beautiful misty opening in the forest through the portal of the trees and that's kind of like what the story is about like a tree planted it's about a future with no trees and a teenage scientist who lives in a city under a dome who's taking care of the world's last tree that's dying has to figure out 
how to travel back in time and meet her great, great, great grandmother who saved seeds of trees for the future. So kind of like time travel um, and strong girl character, scientist, teenager, saves the day. And does she lead the people of the city outside the dome? And what will she find out there after chemical wars destroyed the whole earth, except for a few cities under domes, and there weren't many people left and stuff. That's a good read. And um, yeah, that's one of my fiction books, science fiction. And then I do fantasy. Yeah, that's me looking like an idiot at the Renaissance Fair in Big Bear, California. Yep, got my shield and uh, yeah, my cape. It's really green, actually. And my peacock skirt. What was I thinking? Uh, that peacock skirt was just a little crazy. So that is my fantasy novel. And Sayla is my very favorite character I ever created. And I'm doing Sayla too, called Sayla and the Prisoner. And it's the true story of how Jose, my husband, and I met when I was his English teacher in a prison and he was a prisoner. That was two and a half years ago. And I write it like a fantasy novel in the third person point of view, because I don't want it to be like a tell all book written in the first person. It's more like on an alternate planet in an alternate universe. It really, you read it, you'll see it. The, the names are different. The geography is different. The technology is different. It's not quite earth. <laughs> and Sela too is from a time like our time, kind of modern times with computers and stuff. And someday I will write Sela 3, and that Sela will be a starship captain. Yeah, because I kind of always wanted to, to do that if I could have another career. Actually, after thinking about being the whole captain thing, I thought, no, you know, maybe I'd rather be the ship doctor. I could take care of people. It's kind of a toss-up. Do I be the captain with all that responsibility for all those lives? And any decision I make could just completely destroy us in an instant. I mean, that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> or do I be the ship's doctor? And, oh, you know, I could make mistakes doing that too. And people could die. Maybe I would be the ship's interpreter because I'm pretty good with languages. That might be the safest part of a ship's job. But anyway, Sela 3, Sela and the Stars, I will write someday. Therefore, my email is selatrilogy at yahoo.com. S-E-L-A-H. Um, it's backwards, <laughs> but maybe you can see the name on here. And in the back, there's a photo of me. It tells about the book and me. <laughs> and that's me in New Zealand. Because, yeah, I lived in New Zealand. It was wonderful. Most beautiful place on the planet. And that photo was taken on the South Island. And it's true. The further south you go in New Zealand, the more beautiful it gets. So then, you know, I got back to America. And life was hard. And I had, couldn't find a teaching job after my divorce. So, stupid me. <laughs> or maybe brave me, I'm not sure which, <laughs> decided to go overseas to teach English in Russia, which I could only take for six months. It was very cold and a bit unfriendly. And then after that, Turkey, where I lived the longest and had the most fun and the food was the best and the tea and the cafes late at night and the people were friendly and beautiful countryside, the ocean and rivers and mountains and forests. And it, it even had a little bit of desert <laughs> in Cappadocia area and um, all kinds of culture and sultans and sultanas and palaces in Istanbul. I mean, it was amazing. Beautiful gates and things. And the, just the architecture goes back thousands of years because the Greeks had lived in that area and then the Romans and then the Christians, <laughs> then the Muslims moved in. So it has quite the history. In fact, I saw this one church that had been a Greek temple converted into a Christian church, converted into a mosque, and then kind of back again to Christian and sort of it was like half mosque, half Christian. <laughs> yeah, that's Turkey. <laughs> and then my book, Walk With Me in Turkey, Sorry, the names are all backwards. <laughs> you could practice your backwards reading skills. That is my book about Turkey. And this is a beautiful palace in Istanbul. 
and it has like huge gates. I mean, there's someone walking in those gates and she's like as high as the words, the huge gates into the palace and gold letters. And it was so cool. And this palace called Top Kapi Sarayi, which in Turkish means Top Kapi Palace, <laughs> was such a cool place. And so was Istanbul. And this is my, hey, come to Turkey. It's a beautiful country and it's full of history and you won't believe it. If you're an archaeologist, you can just find a whole bunch of abandoned Roman columns in a, in a like, in a, a the backyard of a building, I saw it, <laughs> and you could just get to work and, and restore those columns with all the writing on them and all the history, and you can find underground tunnels in Izmit, Kojeli, where also those columns were, and you could just like have so many archaeology, I mean, I'm really smart, archaeology um, projects that you would not even have to go looking for them. <laughs> Turkey's great, um, and I wish it could have stayed longer, but their president became kind of a dictator. And I started making videos about their freedom protests and police attacking tourists and other people, police attacking peaceful protesters who were Turkish walking peacefully with their grandchildren and so on. Um, and it got kind of bad. So I had to actually leave because I started writing a series of articles about their freedom protests for a Canadian news magazine called Digital Journal. And I turned all those into another book. Well, actually, first I did all the fun, happy, where to find the good food and culture and explore in Turkey. And that was in this book. And then I did the whole serious, hey, give those Turks their freedoms back book. Because, you know, Ataturk um, brought Turkey into the 20th century and created as a secular democracy with a constitution like America has that guarantees the Turks freedom of speech and freedom of the press and freedom of religion and freedom to peacefully assemble. And all those things have just been taken away, sadly, by their current dictator. So I wrote, oops, <laughs> this one. That's Ataturk the founder of Turkey. And these are friends of mine. And they're in Istanbul and they're protesting. One of them's wearing the Turkish flag. Look again. And this is my band book. <laughs> and this is why I had to leave Turkey because police showed up at my apartment right after I left to arrest me because, you know, it wasn't good for me to to critique, <laughs> criticize their dictator. <sighs> yeah, that's a long story. Um, and I have friends. I have a friend I mentioned yesterday, <laughs> or actually it was like early this morning, um, who was a special ops Turkish officer, and he had been arrested for the fake coup. Coup. <laughs> coup, that's bad. My French is terrible. The fake coup that happened in Turkey in 2016 Erdogan set it all up so he could have supreme and absolute power. And he arrested a whole bunch of people, former special army officers, regular army officers, anyone, judges and, I mean, court judges and um, educators and anyone who disagreed with him. He pretty much arrested even this Christian pastor who was American, Pastor Brunson, you probably read about him. He just went around arresting, arresting all kinds of people, even the wives of men who were arrested, got arrested too, with their kids, put in jail. I mean, that'd be fun. You've got, you're pregnant. You've got your little kids in jail with you. Huh. Oh yeah, try that one out. Um, so a whole lot of people got arrested and some escaped and my friend Davut escaped and I found out that he made it to a safe country in Europe. Yep. And I sent him a letter well, you know, a message on Messenger on Facebook, and I hope he writes back because it was so nice to know he's still alive. And he did stay out of Turkey because after he got arrested and put in, in jail, in prison, but then he was released and then he escaped by swimming from a Turkish island to a Greek island. They're right close to each other in the uh, Western Aegean Sea between Greece and Turkey. And then from Athens, Greece, he was there a while. He went to a safe European country, and I'm glad to know he's still alive. Davut, I miss you. I hope you're okay. So sorry I couldn't help you more at the time you needed it two and a half years ago. America is expensive, and I was in California barely surviving. So 
Those are my books, and they're all about surviving in one way or another. And I'm wearing my hat, which is like my Army Ranger free hat that I got, I don't know, somewhere on the internet. <laughs> and because, um, you know, it's like waterproof and keeps out the sun and all that. And it's camouflage. <laughs> um, and sometimes I do feel like kind of like I'm a soldier in a special soldier job. <laughs> But I just wanted you to know that I did not pick that name out for myself. I was told I have survival skills and the name kind of stuck. Oh, I'll make a survival series in my writing and I'll talk about a girl who survives this in this book, Sela of the Summit. It's about not me. It's about a young girl. She's like a teenager, a young girl. She's a slave in a desert in like a a desert kind of castle and there's a evil master who controls the little desert castle and she has to go get the water when it's all hot and serve him at the banquet table and one night a mysterious stranger in a green cloak with a hood comes to dinner at the master's table and gives Selah the slave a gift and it's a small little snowflake that doesn't melt and she's never seen anything like it. Doesn't even know what it is at first. I mean, she she lives in the desert. She's a slave girl. She doesn't even remember her parents or how she became a slave. I guess she was just born into it. And she would look up at the mountains in the distance at the summit. And they were white and blue with sky above them and white below with snow. And wish she could explore them. And that little snowflake becomes a kind of key. And the stranger becomes someone very special who leads her out of that slavery jail little castle in the desert up the whole mountain the up the the lowlands and the canyons and the hills up the mountain to the top to the summit where the snow is and amazing things happen there's a whole love story and you've got to read it Sela, she's my alter ego, my favorite character. So I am a survival woman. And in a way, I'm Sela, S-E-L-A-H. Yeah, it's right here. Backwards. <laughs> yeah, that works, right? And it's a Hebrew word, and it means musical pause or interlude in a psalm, like, you know, Psalm 30 or Psalm 23, are beautiful little poems that are set to music sometimes. And Selah is a word from there. And I love the Psalms and they have gotten a lot of people through really bad situations and helped them survive just by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And talking about Yea, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And I love that part. And then at the end, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup runs over. You know, you fill it up so much, it's just spilling out my little silver cup like Selah would have in her world. And I will live and I will dwell. I will live in the house of the Lord forever. So, you know, I just shortened that a lot. Uh, Psalm 23 is a really good thing to memorize. And people who face difficult situations have actually repeated it and found a little strength and courage to get through a hard time. So I would just like to say thanks for watching. And I'm a survival woman because a psychologist with a PhD degree, looked at me and said, you've got some survival skills. And it just stuck. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, all the books I write are about surviving, surviving cancer, surviving loss of your family, surviving spousal abuse and divorce, surviving bad car accidents, and whatever else surviving going overseas alone, and getting attacked by men and having to use your self defense trained to fight them off, <laughs> get away, you know. Um, so whatever you're facing, 
I hope you can find the secret to survive it. And I personally think you ought to call on the name of Jesus and that he can be with you even through the valley of the shadow of death. And why does he even, this part I didn't get, why does he prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies? I mean, hey, you know, I'd rather just have family and friends. <laughs> but there's a point to that, that even if you're sitting at a table with enemies, which was true for David, who wrote the psalm, who was a shepherd boy, who wrote beautiful poems and played music, and he became the king of Israel. And the first king, Saul, hunted David down as if he were some kind of animal because Saul did not want to turn over the kingdom to some stupid little shepherd boy who was barely even grown up. <sighs> so I guess the, the table in the presence of my enemies is when things are really, really bad and you have to live with those enemies <laughs> and eat with them, trust that the Lord, he can be with you and he can give you a silver cup and I should have a silver cup here to show you. I've got one from China. Okay, here's a silver. Now this is a Chinese cup. I'm going to pretend. And this is my Chinese teapot. And I was like, you, pre you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. Yeah, just put so much in there, you know. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell, live, in the house of the Lord forever. That's how David ended Psalm 23. And the house of the Lord sounds really cool. And I hope I see you there. <laughs> this is Lana Lisa Williams, aka Survival Woman, signing off.